So I'll just start telling you a little bit about um, what Relens is and where it came from. So it, it emerged as a workshop out of a project that um, Amir and I were involved in at the new school, um, which is University of New York City, if you're not from here. And um, we're both in the School of Media Studies, and we're both interested in um, in how media uh, is neither old or new, or what we call new media may not be so new. It may be reemerging, and um, and we're artists who are interested in um, in how media of the past can inform creativity um, going forward. Um, it's also a question of sustainability. Um, I know if you're a media artist you, and you work in any kind of digital format, you keep accumulating lots and lots of it. Whether you're actually an artist or not, you have like old cell phones, new cell phones, um, and the stuff piles up as e-waste, and we're trying to think about ways that we can remediate old media and make it um, uh, new things happen. Um, so ReLab was, is a project that was to both a archive project where we were interested in um, uh, gathering old media, particularly at the New School, and, and which has had a media production program since the 1960s, um, and how we could, um, first, of all, first of all, tell a story about it, and then make it possible for students and, and faculty to reuse it in creative ways. Um, it started as this re-lens, which, which is interested in how lenses in particular um, are a technology that we can continue to use and reuse um, in creative ways uh, by understanding optics and, and really rummaging through old, old glass that is pretty inexpensive and can readily be adapted to fit on um, digital cameras which we're going to show you today. Um, when we first did the workshop, it was a two-day retreat, so we had lots of time to, um, to experiment and interact. So I'm going to sort of, Amir and I are going to kind of go through um, what you can do. I'm going to put it into a little context. And, um, and we're really happy to answer questions and stuff um, that you might have about how you, could, um, how you can do this stuff and we have some even assignments for you at the end of this lecture where you can, and hopefully you can post what you've made um, as well. Any luck with the mirror? Hello. Hi, I hear him. Can you hear me, yeah. Oh, can That's you so hear, great. I guess, okay, hi. Hello, hi everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Oh yeah. Well, in these strange times of, of uh, self-isolation or practicing isolation, I'm joining you all remotely. Yeah. But uh, I think this will work just fine. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm just going to start by putting a little, this also what ReLab is and this project of what um, the work that Amir and I do in different, in different ways and separately, but together, um, I think it m emerged emerges alongside of a, a larger field called media archaeology. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, I didn't put up the slide for ReLab. Can we go to the slide for a second? Um, yeah, this was ReLab. So if you ever wanted to visit us um, and see what ReLab was and all the workshops we've done, um, it's about the idea that students of media think and engage more meaningfully when they deeply understand the material history of their subject. So media archaeology is a field um, that we generally say our work has emerged alongside of, and we're interested in it also as a, an analytical tool, um, which is generally a set of, of conceptual and methodological, methodological tools that focus on the materiality of media. So if you listening to us have ever taken like sort of a media studies class or a film studies class, and you've sort of um, watched a film and done a kind of narrative or textual analysis of it, media, media archeology, span rather than looking at the text, doing the textual analysis, does a kind of textual analysis of the screen itself, the, the material of the screen itself, rather than the narrative that's on the screen. Um, so it's interested in acknowledging the stuff of media history and culture. So the stuff of media, of media history and culture is made out of 
minerals and, and, and metals um, and plastics. Um, it, the, the, the way we're communicating with each other now is through infrastructures that support our signal traffic, um, and those are material infrastructures, and how do they, um, how are they mediated? Um, media archaeology is interested in all of that. Um, and so I've given on this slide, there's just sort of some of the literature um, that's emerged out from the field of media studies, or sorry, media archaeology. And as you can see, there's also a bent towards sustainability. Not all media archaeology um, is, is, is interested in the environment, but I think it's almost always suggest a fundamentally ecological project because we're interested in the substrates, the material, the material stuff of media. Um, and that makes it politicized in some way. Um, and I think that's also, again, a place where Amir and I are coming from. Uh, maybe we can also add, um, I, I just echo everything that Malik has just said, that, that a lot of this also was, was informed by, by our own practice and after uh, often dealing with these uh, issues of specifically kind of uh, accumulating all this technology and then trying to figure out um, how to actually use it uh, in, in newer projects. And we have all witnessed this drive towards like upgrades and towards uh, constant replacement of technology that should always make these projects look slicker, better, etc. But somehow uh, um, it was it was kind of disheartening looking in our boxes of, of, of different kind of tools that we've used in our in our filmmaking and artistic practice. And, and thinking that all of this could go simply to waste, so which is sort of a troubling thought. And also, on the other hand, I, from some of my field experiences, like specifically uh, photographic work, um, um, you're often in a situation where you just simply cannot necessarily put the tool, you work with what's available, uh, just due to certain circumstances or funding or whatever it is. And this is usually uh, a moment where uh, it's, it's important to be, you know, creative with the tools that we have and not be wasteful with, uh, with, these, with these devices, right? Um, so for me, it was kind of a, uh, I think, a key moment was to kind of resurrect these technologies and to say like, okay, well, these can work and we can do quite a bit with them. Uh, plus they also, as you will see, and Mel and I will talk about this more, how they can really inform the aesthetics and how they can bridge what is considered the old and new and why the analog practices are, are interesting and, and how analog technologies are inherently open sourced. We often don't deal with what's known now widely as a black box. Uh, so they provide important uh, pedagogical advantages. Uh, so in a sense that they're not uh, automated and that they're not proprietary. Right, so, um, so to put, say, media archeology span into creative practice or make it as, a, as a, an approach, um, one, one is interested in the themes of obsolescence, of, of, of of um, consumer electronics that are have built in obsolescence and how we can think about ways to sort of what 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 uh, is called circuit bending, meaning and, and extending the life, say the lifespan of of something that's meant to have have a a, a shorter lifespan. So we're going to be today like working with you know lenses that were built in the 1950s, but still can give us beautiful images and are really cheap and readily available um, and give us really some really interesting um, effects. So, oh, and here's just in terms of, let's see, the life cycle of a lens. Um, you, can, you can see that, that it takes certain amount of, um, of extraction of minerals, um, of, of waste, um, to create a lens and then all the way to the end of its life cycle, it's again created as waste. Um, so we want to think about ways of mitigating waste by, by reusing these lenses. Um, 
Yeah. You want to go? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do, uh, yeah. Great. So I'm thinking about this slide. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Let well, me know if you want to. Shall I go forward? Sure. I'll, I'll, this is fine. You can okay. stay. On, you can stay on the previous one for for a moment. Um, just thinking about the imaging technology and how widespread it, it is. Um, I think it's kind of important to try and recall the number of cameras and lenses that you yourself, all of us, have encountered, owned, or used in our, in our lifetime. And it's very easy to overlook devices that have been almost an integral part of our communication habits and protocols uh, in recent times. Um, and that includes a variety of cell phones, a variety of different kinds of tools and technologies. and also getting used to, to, to the way they actually communicate and, and this image of, of a glitch in a, in a Skype uh, video conference is something we've seen so many times, but it's also an image that is kind of, it, it, it says more than that. Um, it can also mean an obsolete technology or an obsolete piece of equipment that is to be replaced. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, and I don't know how many of you have had one of these uh, connected to your computer um, back in the day, but uh, I think we all went through, like, God knows how many uh, web cameras that we've used for early days of video conferencing. And we often don't necessarily think of this as, as an imaging technology, but it is an imaging technology in many ways. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide, um, but if you're Specifically for photographers and filmmakers, and all the artists are, are, are who are using these uh, imaging technologies, specifically for photographic tools. What happens is that you often end up with something like this: an array of, of over over span several years, uh, decades. Sometimes you end up with this uh, uh, large amount of glass, plastic, metal uh, lenses that you've used for different projects. Uh, and with an introduction of a new system that usually can sort of be considered as uh, obviously obsolete. And what does that really mean? Um, so when we started doing this, and um, I've been experimenting like a couple of years before that, I've, exp I've been experimenting with different cameras, uh, also driven by this idea, well, I have to find a way to use my old Nikon lenses use some of my uh, lens, uh, lenses that I use them on, with my 16 millimeter camera, etc., on the new bodies and not just simply put it aside, let it collect dust and then look for ways to, I don't know, go into depth by buying some kind of a new lens that is possibly equivalent to what I had originally. So if we go to the next, next uh, slide. So, when we're talking about lenses, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into, into any details about this because I don't want to, to, we don't want to turn this into a really kind of a, a photography workshop. But, you know, there are three things that you can kind of think about when we're, when we're looking at characteristics of a lens. There's really a focal length, the angle of view, uh, the, its aperture, the iris, the f-stop hole, the speed of a lens, um, how much light it lets through, whether it's good for low light condition, etc. And one key kind of element in these, uh, in these sort of, so to say, sustainable practices or repurposing or redirecting these lenses is the mount type or how these lenses are attached to these camera bodies. Whether they're threaded, um, there's, there's threaded amount type with the bayonet, or there's this one almost as a breech lock. So if we go to uh, the next slide. Um, this is just briefly, like I didn't really want to include this slide either, but it goes from kind of a wide angle view, which would be an 18 millimeter screen to something that's a, um, a more like a telephoto. But in general, you can distinguish between prime lenses, which have a fixed focal length, so they have this kind of a fixed, a fixed view, and they're usually generally sharper, um, and they have a higher quality in these telephoto or zoom lenses that have a variable focal length. So from wide to, to really kind of uh, um, to, to really kind of close and tight. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can fly through these. Uh, again, so mentioning uh, that the lens mount is really a mechanical and electrical interface uh, between the lens and the camera, and you find these common types that are threaded. 
And you'll find this with, with older lens mounts, which we're going to talk about a little bit today, uh, such as C-mount and T-mount lenses, which are, there's thousands of them uh, everywhere. Um, and I, I myself can find some also in, in, in garbage and containers as well. There's biomet lenses, um, which most neural lens systems are such as the, the Canon or Sony or Leica and Icon uh, lenses are, you find those everywhere. And four thirds or micro four thirds, and this format is kind of important. Uh, it was important for, for our practice because it was one that is easily suitable or easily adaptable uh, when using old lenses. And there's something that's going to reach a lot that you see with all the Canon lenses. Maybe we can go to the next slide. So the C mount, why uh, previous previous one, I think, or we can stay we can stay on this Rolex shot. That's that's great. Um, so the C mount lenses, you'll find them. Obviously, anyone who has been shooting 16 millimeter um, has used these, and they're really they've been for a while just sort of the, the key or the main sort of lenses for a lot of filmmakers, documentarians. Uh, etc. Uh, and there's a wide variety of them available. Um, they usually they're just mechanical. Um, they require usually just a little bit of love if they're old and kind of dusty uh, to bring them back to life. So it's nothing, uh, nothing that is too difficult. It's not one of these kind of black box uh, so the technologies or that, that we deal with today, so they can easily be be brought back to life. Um, so, and, and for us, this was, this was very important and for me also personally, sort of how to see how we can use some of these lenses on the newer cameras, uh, making, so to say, a perfect marriage between these two uh, technologies. So if we go to the next slide, also where you will find uh, C-mount lenses, which is quite interesting, uh, are a lot of CCTV systems, so surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras also predominantly use a C-mount lenses. Some of them use T-mount lenses. And there are tons of these also being discarded. So it, it often helps to rummage through, through some of these if, if you see them and find some lenses. I, I myself have several of these that kind of, so to say, save them from, 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 the, from, from going just basically into, the, into trash. Uh, but they usually render very interesting images and they have very particular aesthetics. So I think they're also uh, easily, uh, uh, easily repurposed, uh, can be, they can be easily repurposed. Um, so now, what, when, you, when you look at all these lenses, um, um, it, what's, what's interesting, so Nikon, for example, the F mount can also be used in a variety of different cameras. Even the older Nikon lenses you can, you can use on a lot of these cameras, which a lot of people don't know or don't even try. But there are adapters that are actually used to do this in a variety of different adapters. They're relatively cheap, and they help actually bridge these two technologies together. So if we can go, maybe let's go a few forward because I want to quickly talk about, yeah, next, next one. It's... Um, okay. Oh yeah, this one, yes, the sensor size. So when, when talking about this, uh, and specifically using these uh, kinds of technologies, what, what, what really what's important to know is the, is the sensor size and, and crop factors. Um, all of these cameras obviously have, you know, you have digital sensors in them, you have a, you have, you have a mount for the lens, and um, the, the thing to remember is really that the sensor coverage size is important for the lens, whether it's one inch or on two, two thirds uh, or anything like that, and also resolution of the lens if there are newer, for example, CCTV lenses uh, that you can find. So it's important to know some of this uh, about the specification. All right, so, and looks can be also somewhat deceiving. So, you know, what looks like CMOM. Uh, it's important to kind of you know try it out or to look at like how it really covers the covers the, the, the chip. Um, and obviously, when you're when you're using this, what you end up often with is sort of a vignetted image or cropped image because the lens is simply not doesn't cover the, the full size of the sensor. 
which uh, you can play with by, by cropping digitally then this image. And that also renders the interesting result that we'll be able to see. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, I can also show you some cropping. Oh, great. Yes, yeah, if you, yeah, if you, if you, oh. like this. Mm -hmm. so this is the cropped from, from, um, uh, Mal, do you want to do us there real mm -hmm. quick what, what the camera and the lens is? I'm trying, but it's not doing it. That's okay. <laughs> So, so what you'll find is often that because of this crop, I mean, you end up with a, usually a tighter, tighter view because the amount of lenses that you will find yeah, all over the place um, will usually end up looking a little bit cropped if you use it on a on a very large chip uh, camera, such as like one of these like Canon 5Ds or one of these Nikon or new Sony uh, cameras that have a pretty large chip. And the, the, the lens itself will not cover the full size of the chip. You always have to kind of crop the image, but you will get sometimes interesting vignetting effects, which, you know, depending on what kind of aesthetics you're going for, may be interesting. So, yeah, I see, I see actually you're just adjusting the focus on these ones. These ones these, yeah. Um, so, and I think, uh, uh, Mel, is this the Olympus camera with so, some kind of a yeah, lens? This is the Olympus with a with a with a Switar twenty six millimeter lens, mm -hmm. which would be a basically a normal lens. Although this is ma a macro lens, so you can sort of get really close. Mm -hmm. um, but you can just see just a little bit of cropping um, or vignetting. Mm -hmm. Sorry, on the mm -hmm. bottom of the of the screen. I don't know if you guys are seeing it, um, but in general, it's a very beautiful image for from a lens that's probably 70 years old and a camera that's probably what, like 20 years? What, how old is it? This is this Olympus camera, it's micro four years, I think, three or four. Three or four probably, years old. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, also a pretty affordable camera. Mm -hmm. the, and the thing is that um, if we if you quickly switch back to the to the slides where when, okay there we go so this is usually the the size of chips that you'll find in these cameras around and it's, I know that this can be kind of a totally turned into a tech geeky talk mm -hmm. <laughs> about these but this is just to you know sort of what's out there what you find like with these a lot of these like kind of prosumer. Uh, cameras, but what's interesting for us is this really this micro four thirds format, which is somewhere in between. You know, it has a smaller chip, not that light sensitive as, as, as these bigger cameras, obviously. However, it fits the C mount lens perfectly as this Olympus camera is is doing. So there's several different manufacturers that make the micro four thirds camera, and especially if you find some older ones, people even like get rid of them and give them out for free. Uh, it's it's kind of amazing what you can do with some of these cameras. There are plenty of them that have been in production for over 10 or 12 years now. And they're also some of the early models are obviously considered obsolete. Yeah. But in fact, they're really, uh, they can produce kind of quite incredible images when you're pairing them up with these older lenses. So this is why the Micro Four Thirds was an interesting format for us uh, to, to experiment with. But you could really repurpose a lot of these old lenses and use them on on newer bodies uh, and, completely like and, even even cameras that have larger chip sizes and just to say when we we were going to do this live with with students um tinkering with us we also we have a, a panasonic lumix micro four thirds camera as well um and again the the adapter that we got which is just um a micro four thirds to to c mount adapter um, was is a ten dollar part, um, so it's a, a, an easy a, an easy way to make a new interface from an old from an old from an old technology to a newer technology, um, mm -hmm. which is again one of the things that we're really interested in interfaces. Questioning questioning newness and oldness and what's obsolete and how we can extend the life of of certain um, media technologies. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to go through some of these lenses that we have here and see what they yeah, do? Yeah, that would be great. I was just okay. thinking that would be nice okay. to kind of just quickly look at. All right. Um, 
So what, let's see. I mean, I can if you want with the camera, you can come over here and I can just show you a few of them. So just to say, I, I'm a filmmaker and I also I work in a lot in analog film, 16 millimeter film. Um, so I'm very accustomed to using these lenses that come with a, a camera called the Bolex camera. Um, but they they again they <clears throat> pile up and they're they're good lenses, but they're use is, is limited to um, this C mount, this C mount, so, um, which is this, you know, you kind of, you, you, you screw it on like a, like a screw. But anyway, so this is a Bell & Howell Ingenue, let's see, I don't know what size it is, I'll tell you in a minute. This is a 50 millimeter Ingenue lens, oops, I should go in the this is a 15 millimeter, and oh, by the way, and so when we're working in micro four thirds, um, we're working in a, um, basically with a normal focal length being 25 millimeters, is that right, Amir? And then anything yeah. that's, that's longer than 25 millimeters is gonna be, is gonna be like a telephoto lens, and anything that's less than 25 millimeters would be a wide angle lens, so we have a whole, um, Array. So the one that I have on the camera now is is about is a normal lens. We have a 75 millimeter Kern Pyard, and I'll swap some out and a 10 millimeter Kern Pyard. And I can actually I'll just swap out this lens in a in a second, um, so you can see the difference of what happens from a normal lens to to a pretty long lens. While I'm talking, while I'm doing the swap, one of the fun. These are all, as Amir said, prime lenses or fixed focal length lenses. All right, I'm going to switch to, okay, can we switch to the camera view? And you're going to see that I'm so close that I'm not going to see anything. I can see it on here, it's just, oh, oh yeah, it is there, okay. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to focus on that one. This one's not turning. All right, you're getting a, just a blurry image, sorry. Let me give you, let me try the 10 millimeter. I think one of those had like a really tight focus. Yeah, I, I, could, I couldn't it turn the focus. It needed to be kind of re-cleaned. I think that's what it. that deal was. All right, so this is a, wow. a really wide lens, which is why you're getting much more vignetting on this one. It's a 10 millimeter, and so you're seeing the whole studio. And you're getting almost the fisheye effect, almost. It's so wide. But you're also seeing the edge of the, um, the, len the, the edge of the lens element. That's basically what you're seeing, right, with the, with the, with the vignette. Um, let's see, what else do we have? This 50 millimeter will be a little bit. One more, I'll just do one more to show you. And then I'll show you one other weird thing we have. Simulator lens. And so because of the crop factor of the, of the camera itself, so always the focal length is, if it says 16 millimeter, that means it's 32 millimeters. It's always double right. just because of the, but just because of the crop factor. So what I'm looking at here, oh, there we go. So this is a 50 millimeter lens you could see. So that's a basically a telephoto lens. So you're getting a lot less of the crop than the wide angle lens. Can we can we switch to a camera view? Oh, we're not in the camera view? I'm seeing it. But oh yeah, but I'm not oh but I don't know if I'm seeing the actual feed um, that goes out. So. Right, there we go. Yeah. Yep. Um Again, you're, I'm not seeing any crop on this. I don't know if you see it on yours. But no, no. Yeah. So it's pretty much the full. 
So when we did when we did this project with students um, in a workshop, um, we were both shooting video and still still photography. You could do both. Um, oh, one other weird thing I have is this um, slide duplicator, um, or or actually a, a thirty five to sixteen millimeter printer. So if you said you say you wanted to at, at some point. Um, many years ago, you would want you wanted to um, either duplicate a slide onto 16 millimeter or to um, or to minimize the the gauge of your film from 35 to 16. You could have you could have used this gadget, and we could use it for different things. So, for instance, I I can it's just a a C mount lens and again the same these same lenses like Amir was talking about you could um, most um, surveillance lenses you know CCTV lenses are C-mount so any old weird surveillance lens you could put on one of these so if I'm gonna see if this is gonna work oh you're seeing I don't know if you're seeing this thing turning so basically we're looking at a screen and if I put a slide in there, um, oops, I have it upside down. You can put things on a slide. This, uh, this slide only has a, a drawing of an X on it, but, um, but you can imagine that you could put old, old slides that you find in a, at, a, at, a, um, at a vintage a junk store or your you know, old grandparents' slides that they might have in a, in a, in a book. Um, you could reduplicate them or you could actually draw on a little slide. You could sew things, do whatever you like. So that's another interesting thing. And I'm sure that you could find one of these on eBay fairly easily. Um, it's also interesting to, you know, to think about even thinking about lens lists and what you could do, mm -hmm. how you, I've, I've, saw at a festival a, an interesting film that was made lensless or with the filmmaker making a lens out of their own, an aperture out of their own hand. I can't do it exactly here, but you can imagine you can make a pinhole um, with your hand or with a, um, or with some, some, some cardboard and, a, and a, an actual pin. So let me just put one more one more lens on here, and we'll talk. And maybe I'll throw it over to Amir to talk about some some ways that artists have applied these this kind of work. Oh, we're back to a pretty so some with oh, which one is this? This is a. 15 millimeter lens, so pretty wide. So you're get, again getting the vignetting around the around the edges. So maybe we'll go back to our slides. Let's see. Oops, I think I did something to the slide. Oh, there we go. Um. So Am I we, on the slide? Oh, oh, sorry, the... yeah. There, thanks. <laughs> Oops, I have to put it into show. Do a full, uh, full yeah. view. So yeah, this is yeah, this slide is just basically kind of interpreting what we were just talking about. That uh, ultimately, you know, if the lens is uh, meant or, or marked to give you a focal length that is within this red square on a crop sensor and micro four third cameras, which are, you know, everywhere, you would probably get a crop view, which is basically in that blue, uh, blue square that you, that you see there. And, but, you know, we've experimented really with C-mount uh, uh, lenses, mostly because we had plenty of these around, and they're also, you can find them easily, like, used, and, like, sometimes you'll, you'll find, like, a box of these that people are trying to get rid of. Uh, and they really render interesting results, often really high quality uh, 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 images also on these, on these devices. Uh, and obviously the other reason being that they're also, uh, that you'll find CCTV 
uh, lenses easily if you if you if you you know if you look for to, to experiment with these. Obviously, uh, and here's the, the this next slide. Uh, uh, you would need um, an adapter, right? So this here's this, here are a few some some images of different adapters you will find out there that can be kind of uh, used with these uh, with these cameras. And the nice thing is, like with this micro four thirds system, and that is very highly adaptable, is that you will find adapters for almost every mount that has been around there for like uh, decades and decades. So it, it's it's great to be able to repurpose lenses, like you know, I don't know, old Minolta lenses or anything like that. Anything that you can find at, at these at garage sales or anything, it's very likely that you're going to find one of these cheap adapters. Some of them really being, you know five, six bucks to, you know, maybe some, maybe a little bit more if they're, uh, if they require some kind of specific sort of electronic kind of contact. Um, but you'll find them and you will be able to kind of connect these lenses and use them in your, in your, in your image making practice. So in the next slide, you see there's like one of these rig systems with sentry optics on, on, on one of these uh, uh, Lumix cameras. And this camera now also is also considered quite old, actually, I think, so the GH2. Um, a lot of indie filmmakers, people on budget, really enjoyed using this camera because it read really good images and you were able to really connect some high end lenses and old lenses also to it and create really interesting images with it. And I think in the next slide, there's this camera that uh, with a variety of different uh, 60 mil lenses is, is now just showing. Um, in the next slide you'll see that you know people get really creative with this. Um, I think I don't know if we can see the next slide here. Um, in the um, right after this one and it's this repurposed if you go one slide forward, yeah it's <laughs> you can see that people are really creative, kind of adopting even anamorphic lenses, old Russian anamorphic lenses, to to shoot with them, uh, and producing kind of quite an interesting imagery. Uh, the lens that you see here was actually used by 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 Andrei Tarkovsky, uh, one of the same ones that you found with Tarkovsky one of his own. Um, and this is also to say that uh, in, in the next slide, I think you'll see that um, there have been a variety of different sorts of uh, adapters out there. Some of them also uh, made for those smartphones. So the smartphone imaging, imaging technology is enabling you to attach uh, these lenses and using the, the, the phone as the actual image taking technology. Uh, and there have been some interesting results with this. Um, so artists and filmmakers have been experimenting with this uh, and this is also to say it's not only that there have been these kinds of like experimental films or experimental projects of photography made with it. You will find also a variety of really high-end productions that have used this. Um, so we can maybe go to the to the next slide. So if you're familiar with the Canadian filmmaker Guy Mazin, you you probably know, and he's one of these people who've been, like for a long time, has been using uh, old glass and, and uh, repurposing it, using it on digital newer bodies, but also shooting with old 16 millimeter cameras. And it became really something like, like a trademark also, uh, this specific static mode. Okay, of course, you know, there's, there's there are costumes and there are other things also involved. But lenses are an important part of this process, and what I always appreciate uh, appreciated about this is that his films, when you look at the really the production costs, are really not wasteful when it comes to technology. They're usually uh, using a, a lot of old tools, readily available tools, recycled uh, glass to make these images, and also he would apply. Uh, gel or Vaseline to 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 these lenses to also create very specific looks which you see in these images that that are in all, all over his films actually any film of his that you see including the last one that was shot with a digital body camera that um, was was actually used uh, used used different kinds of C mount lenses on it. 
And also one of the interesting filmmakers that has been also experimenting with this is Park chang who probably most of you know, uh, an old buddy, one of the films, Simply for Lady Vengeance, is another film that really made a popular South Korean amazing filmmaker. But he made also this film, uh, uh, he used these systems uh, in several of his films, but Night Fishing was completely shot on an iPhone 4 with one of these uh, adapters using a variety of different camera lenses that he had. Um, and it really, again, it, it renders a very interesting aesthetic, so uh, it, it's an interesting film to look at. But I find this, uh, I find this approach uh, quite, um, I don't know, on one hand, it, it, aesthetically it's interesting, but on the other it's like it somehow, somehow it also kind of uh, trans, uh, transmits a message that you can, you can come up with interesting imagery without necessarily going out and, and buying the newest technology out there, which is what we all try to uh, somehow uh, reduce. And, and, it, and I wanted to show you also, just because I, there are a lot of examples, but also this is an interesting example. This is a film by Fernando Lades, uh, and the director of photography here with Claudia Bulos, and it's called Identifying Features. So in this film, uh, what's interesting is she used one of these newer cameras, Sony camera uh, bodies, uh, and it, it, she achieved really a high-end look with this. So maybe we can play a little bit of this uh, uh, of this trailer now, if you, if you just want to click play on that, on that clip. Um, I can't open the sign. Oh, oh so, you, so if you Let if me you, see if I can. If you can click on the image, oh, it won't work. Hmm. Mm -mm. Okay, maybe maybe just a bit. But if you if you do a search for uh, if you do a search, you will find the trailer to this to this film uh, on YouTube, and it, it's it's interesting to look at because the images are kind of quite quite, uh, quite spectacular, and just beautiful, and this is what she used actually to shoot this film. So in that next slide, you see those, uh, you see those Minolta Rock or MC. Uh, these, are the, these are the lenses that she has used. And these are really old lenses when Minolta was to try to compete with all these different uh, um, uh, manufacturers. And these lenses are, are, you'll find them like all over the place, like for like 15, 20 bucks or so. And she has used these on, on these new bodies to shoot the whole film, and the uh, film really looks like incredible. Um, so this is also to say that it's possible to, to really render high quality images, incredibly crisp images, from this old glass, and not just sort of you know produce something that is rather a little bit obscure or, or smudged or out of focus or has these different vignetting kind of uh, uh, artifacts, so to say. Um, oh. mm -hmm. so, Go ahead, Matt. No, we're, I'm just trying to catch up to where we are. Um, I think actually, even going back, I mean, there's uh, thinking about other kinds of interfaces. Um, I skipped a slide at the very beginning um, to talk about, um, let's say, really eccentric kinds of, um, of interfaces between um, technologies, so, um, and how that can also, uh, let's see, sometimes like, oh, so this is um, a, a, a couple of filmmakers, Layla Nadir and Carrie Adams Peppermint, or film, or artists rather, um, film media artists who are actually creating images by connecting um, image making technologies to um, organic materials. So they made this, this is their microbial selfies interface, meaning they, that as the, as certain old, old, old jellies or things that, that change over time ferment um, and have and grow bacteria as they, as the, the actual food or, um, or organic material changes, it, it signals to the to a processor to take a take a selfie of it um, so these are what we call eccentric interfaces uh, more eccentric interfaces than simply an interface like 
um, a lens adapter that allows us to go from a micro four thirds mount to a, to a C mount. Um, but you can think really eccentrically about, about how you're connecting old and new, um, and, all, and not even old and new, organic and inorganic. Um, and so these are kind of some of the kinds of things that um, we're also interested in, um, in, in rummaging through what we have at, at, hand, at, at hand, I think. Um, let's see, I'm going through our slides. Uh, if you want, uh, I think it was around slide 38. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to that, there are several, there's, uh, there are, I think, one, two, three, four, four images that uh, were made in our last workshop in an experimentation mm -hmm. over a variety of different lenses, including, uh, including even a, a microscopic adapter. So there are, I think, four images that I've added to the presentation. Oh, oops, I, oh shoot, I don't, example. they're not in the one that I have. Or the one that um, I shared, but maybe I could go online. Hang on. Uh, so we, I can go to to Relens. Oh, in Google Drive, yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's in a Google, sorry, it's like a Google slideshow. I think that's what it is. Mm, no, I'm not. We're not on our shared drive. I don't. Oh wait, are we? Oh, okay. Um. Actually, I can show it to you this way. Mm -hmm. I'll go. We can go directly into. This is our. Yeah. This is the, the previous um, workshop that we did, and here's some of the images that the workshop participants took, um, using this. Um, some of them exploited the, the vignetting. Um, in still images. We're also, we were also interested in lenses that not only go on image capturing devices, but also in projection devices, um, thinking about putting different kinds of lenses on, on, um, on projectors, um, also using different kinds of screen interfaces in order to get really different kinds of effects. I think that's a microscopic one that we just This saw. one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, using microscope lenses, getting really interesting effects. We had given the students some 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter film to play with as well. So um, again, play, using most of the tools that we have here, um, you can do a lot of, oops, I'm looking for our slideshow. There we are. Um, mm -hmm. So things that you can do, and maybe you want to challenge yourself to do, um, if you if you wanted to take up the, if you have a micro four thirds lens and you went on and wanted to say, go on eBay and buy a $10 C-mount lens and a $10 um, uh, adapter, um, you could experiment with them and think about things that you could do with them. Um, these may be things that you already have. Um, so, uh, and we would love it if you do experiment with them, if you would post and hashtag us free Relens 2020 so you can see our experiments. Maybe you can talk so a little bit. Possibly on Twitter or Instagram. Mm -hmm. so it would be, be, be great to see something as well. So um, if, uh, should we, I'm not sure if we should uh, show that slide with, uh, uh, with the actual experiment, but yeah, we don't. We don't Which one? Uh, Okay. We have. Oh, well, do, do I we think it's very specific for the for the equipment, which was meant hands-on, so we don't. <laughs> so I don't think it would really apply to okay. for, to, to our participants. Okay. Um, 
if you do if you do try um, experimenting with um, with these combinations of uh, of interfacing um, C mount lenses with micro four thirds cameras, it'd be great if you could also kind of document um, mm -hmm. what you what you've done, what your lens is. Um, so that uh, we can replicate the 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 um, the effects that you're getting, or if people like what you've done, they can replicate them. Um, so, what camera settings you're using, what lens you used, what what optical tools and filters you might have used. Um, uh, we're interested in in sharing our creative you know creative experiments um, so that we learn from each other um, through through um, through this and thinking about. Um, how that's also a kind of sustainable kind of future of creative making. Um, so in addition to simply experimenting with them, um, you can continue to, we have a, a second assignment, which um, you want to explain a little bit about this assignment? About the, the second the assignment? The second one, we, yeah. Posted? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so the idea was like to really continue the, the, uh, the, the experiment and to the goal would be like to really creatively exploit the individual artifacts and, and idiosyncrasies of, of, of uh, analog systems to produce produce what we would kind of consider a hybrid analog digital images that really challenge the, the prevailing kind of medium induced aesthetics. So in other words, that the moving images or images we create should explore the space between the digital and analog, vintage and contemporary, simulated and real and aim for, for really for new aesthetic possibilities. And um, so we, we would like to see what's possible and we are experimenting with this ourselves. And I should also add that I've been also putting, we've been putting this together and uh, eventually we'll have a list with a variety of different cameras mm -hmm. and uh, ways you could possibly repurpose them or how you can use them with a variety of older lenses. So that if you come across some of these, or you have some of them in your uh, somewhere under your desk or on the shelf to see how you can really make this camera uh, bring it back to life. So, uh, I'm, at, at the moment, uh, there's a list of different micro four thirds cameras that can be used that have uh, that have uh, this uh, micro four thirds mount, and you can find a variety of different uh, adapters available for it. But I think that list will simply keep growing, and uh, the idea here would be to actually uh, to have some uh, collaborative. Uh, it would be a collaborative effort where we could create a longer list of of of, uh, of these tools and technologies, and how they can be uh, or how how we can work with them. And we're happy if any if there is anybody um, interested and has questions, we're happy to answer them directly. Um, and we can include our contact information in 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 um, Culture Hub and, and uh, Culture Hub's website stuff. Um, yeah. One thing that also I should quickly add, and we we'll, we've discussed this also, is that if you, for example, if you're doing workshops, if you're if you're teaching image making, that these are kind of, it's, it's amazing what can be done with these, and very often you can collect them for for almost uh, for almost no money, and it works really very well when you're working with, with kids and, and, and certainly different communities that don't have access to a lot of these technologies um, to, to really experiment with them in that context. It's, it's quite, a, quite an event. But we, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of ways to bring to bring bring media back to life. We have, you know, the piles of zombie media that can be revived, <laughs> and it and it and it brings with it its own history, its material history. So using using old technologies is not simply a an act of saving money. It's also it 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 it, it also tells a story because it, the, the 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 objects come with their own memories. Um, in some, in a, in a way, um, and I'm also I'm interested in the sort of discursive possibilities of using old technologies to tell to tell new stories. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks Thank for joining all. us. Yeah.
Beautiful.